So you're up in the middle of the night and you've got the appreciator. And what's he talking about? Who knows? Well, uh, the, the, the sex pistols, they were a big thing. I, I mean, some people listen to punk rock now and really don't know. I mean, the sex pistols were, at least theoretically, the original item. And I guess punk rock has now turned into something that, well, it's tricky because what I think of as goofy, like, you know, Green Day, and even that, I mean, that's old punk rock. Um, I don't even know who purveys it now or if it's even a valid term anymore because I'm an old man. I don't listen to, to you know, the top 40 or even uh, progressive stations or regressive stations. And music genres have just splintered and re-splintered since last I really was into it. I've heard some dark country music. And this this is kind of interesting because it pulls together a genre that, as I've gotten older, I've developed uh, an affection for. And not so much that Garth Brooks country music, but that older, yep, say, Johnny Cash as uh, an example the 1960s and back country music people like uh, Willie Nelson his earlier stuff although it, it, I guess you could call what he does no matter what even when he plays those old standards like blue skies looking at me it, it's done in what can be described as a form of country um, I, I really like like I do with blues the really rootsy original stuff, the stuff that it all grew out of, string band music especially. I mean, just some guys from uh, Tennessee sitting on their porch or that artifice, um, the playing a guitar and singing along uh, in a more natural way. I mean, people like, say, Jimmy Rogers, the father of country music. And punk rock had these fathers, and that, like the Sex Pistols bringing us back around. And they even did a comeback, I mean, after uh, breaking up almost immediately. And the, for whatever reason, I mean, they were never a bunch of guys who organically came together and decided to play. The Sex Pistols, admittedly, was a completely calculated move by a man named Malcolm McLaren, who was, uh, I guess he managed a pre-punk band called the New York Dolls, who uh, were kind of a transvestite, dirtier Rolling Stones back in the early 70s, and uh, the, the led by David Johansson, and Johnny Thunders was the guitar player, and they dressed up like kind of slutty women, performed on stage, and rock and rolled. I mean, that's really what it's about. I mean, it's all that the punk rock is the rock and roll, and really the dark country that I talk about is also the rock and roll. Now, to, to, to digress a little, a mix between, say, punk rock and the rock and roll is a band, say, like Those Poor Bastards, who have a song called Give Me Drugs. They do a cover of I Walk the Line. Uh, they have songs like Crooked Man, This World is Evil. You should check those out if this sounds appealing. And then, of course, there are the latter-day Hank Williams is Hank Williams the third, who does some really um, thrashy, punky, uh, country-flavored music, and Hank Williams the fourth, who's just—I mean, he doesn't have a lot of music out there, but it has this ring of uh, raw punk and country authenticity. Now, the Sex Pistols were led by. Johnny Rotten News, 
I guess they, he's sort of known as Johnny Rotten and John Lydon. And yeah, he's still kicking. Um, they had songs like, well, the, the interesting thing about the Sex Pistols were they made the news and they got a big buzz for being so controversial. And uh, as the documentaries on the Sex Pistols will tell you, they would, these record companies came out and said, oh, we can make some money, would sign them. And then... They would do something so controversial and crazy that the record companies would not release a record by them, buy off their contract, and go away. And then they had songs like God Save the Queen, which sold a lot of records and I believe became the number one song in England, but the BBC refused to play it. And when it became number one, they just left the number one spot on the chart blank. They were like true rebels. And th this, from my rebel self, kind of admires um, just going out there and being so over the top that the mainstream rejects you. And uh, John Lydon, uh, Johnny Rotten, left the band uh, in late 1977 because of the management and what was going on. And it, and it got crazy. They fired the bass player who could really play, Glenn Matlock, um, and hired a bass player who looked more the role, but as Sid Vicious really couldn't play bass guitar very well and also had some drug habits that made his performances a little uneven. But even their show was a big theatrical thing. Um, if I, I used to think, you know, oh, these moves were spontaneous and the things they yelled at the audience and provoking. You know, they toured the United States and in places like uh, Nashville were provoking the audience and... The, the, but this was all apparently scripted because night after night, if you watch or hear the footage of these shows, they pretty much did these same provocations every night. So this was a well-rehearsed, uh, it, it was called the Great Rock and Roll Swindle in the original version of the documentary on them, which was later re-edited and uh, I forget what it was released as, but the original Sex Pistols documentary film was The Great Rock and Roll Swindle. And after John Lydon left, they actually had auditions to find this new Johnny Rotten-like character and uh, a bunch of really goofy guys. And uh, it's like Ten Pole Tudor, who did a few songs with them and then disappeared into obscurity. And a man uh, named Ronnie Biggs, who was a fugitive from the law for committing what was known as the Great Train Robbery back in the 1960s, and he escaped to South America. And they actually, Malcolm McLaren, found him and recorded a couple songs with him. So the Sex Pistols brand just became this iconic thing and led to more important bands they inspired. For example, The Clash, who... I don't know, they were really big uh, in the 70s, early 80s. Uh, their London Calling album, even their Sandinista album and uh, Combat Rock. Uh, they broke the charts and played in big stadiums. They were a big thing, but they also, the pressure of stardom and the idea of punk rock kind of shattered them. Uh, they became Big Audio Dynamite and Joe Strummer, kind of soldiered on and did some neat things but at, the, at the end of the clash they even went out and they were busking in like strange places like railway stations and out on the sidewalks um this they, they were like living a more real punk rock lifestyle than the actual progenitors and the clash of course are big you can find their stuff up to, right on your spotify um, I don't know if they're still played. Like I say, I don't follow the modern music. But John Lydon continued into this rich, experimental noise music with a band which 
remains one of my favorite bands of that era, Public Image. And Public Image uh, was him and Keith Levine, basically, originally. And they did several albums, uh, the peak of which is one called Flowers of Romance, which barely has any guitar. Uh, it's just exotic and strange. And if you're looking for music that really didn't sound like any other music at the time, uh, you will appreciate the Public Image Flowers of Romance album. And, and now, I mean, if the, if you got the YouTube. So this isn't like, I mean, we. I lived in a day where you'd buy these magazines like Cream and Trouser Press and hear about these bands, but you still couldn't hear them unless you knew somebody. And I didn't. I've lived in a rural place. And you, you had to find somebody who had their records or you had to get them yourself. And that was what sparked really. I mean, I was always having a few records, but I became a record fiend in the early 80s. For a few years, it was just every penny went to these import records and import singles so I could hear public image. that They weren't going to play anything by public image even then. I mean, the, and when punk came out, back to the Sex Pistols, the first times I heard them, even I couldn't palate that they were unpalatable. It sounded like a bunch of grinding noise. And that's what's interesting about how music develops. What is yesterday's grinding noise is now playing over the speakers at the supermarket. And that's, that's the progression of sound. I mean, the punk rock and rap music and all of these things that came out and were innovative uh, they, they were offensive to the ear and the sensibilities. And, you know, like I, I like to say, every generation seems to come up with something that the generation before, certainly two generations before, say, oh, that's a bunch of banging and noise. And that dates back to jazz music and the Paul Whiteman Orchestra and D Duke Ellington. Louis Armstrong, uh, I suppose even John Philip Sousa's March music, the, it, they were different than the prevailing sound that the grown-ups listened to. And public image uh, it, it engendered, I mean, Ja Wobble was the original bass player for public image, and he really, much like Sid Vicious, for that matter, was somebody who had just picked the instrument up. Of course, Wobble actually had a feel for it. And over the years, he's developed into um, quite a well-known off-center bass player, playing a lot of uh, interesting world music. Uh, he has a number of albums out, uh, although he got thrown out of public image famously because he took backing tracks from uh, an album they were working on and made his own songs out of them and released them. Although that's the story. I don't know how you sneak out and your bandmates don't know that you're using their tracks or something. That Well, th it was a strange time, and they were all such kids. I mean, they were a couple years older than me, but I was only 20, 21 so these are like early 20s people at the top of a certain form of music doing something so different. And uh, Keith Levine shortly thereafter also left the band. And with Keith Levine, after he left Public Image, he just never quite did a heck of a lot. And he only died last year, a couple of years ago. But he never really... I mean, John Lydon, I even just recently had, uh, he won a Eurovision or he was one of the winners of higher up for his song Hawaii. And uh, the last few years before she passed, he cared for his ill wife, uh, which is just such a touching story. And he's become quite a pop culture personality uh, for his generation. I, I don't know. 
I am really out of what the mainstream media is on music. And I don't know if that's good or bad because that makes me kind of an outsider all over again. Um, I don't read music magazines. I don't look at the music sites. And yeah, I, in fact, these days I hardly even play anymore. I used to do, if you listen to my older shows, I used to fancy myself some sort of a purveyor of experimental music. And perhaps I was, but... Um, after my last band, Evelis, which I mentioned from time to time, and if you search around on uh, my own uh, YouTube, if you go back a ways, or if you search uh, other places, uh, there's a Bandcamp page with a bunch of albums. It, it, that was the last big hurrah for me doing music uh, with Coptic Nerve. And in the old podcast that I have, Quake Reversal Satellite episodes from, say, 2020, 2021. Um, it's really strange uh, that in just such a short time, I feel differently about the value of my creativity, even what I'm doing here. Uh, I'm, I feel like I'm doing something more... just doing it it's not going to be uh I, i've accepted that i'm not going to do some podcast and suddenly be like l like what happens on youtube or in podcasts suddenly you're joe rogan and you're making all this money i i don't think what i do resonates enough with enough people i am really in the back of my head i have thought that somehow or other I would be able to do these things and it, to get some audience. And just for fun, you know, I ought to try to do what it, uh, a Patreon, a Patreon. And, uh, I mean, that's, there are people who actually, I mean, even Peter Bernard, I don't know what he actually makes, but somehow or other he plugs along and he's done a thousand uh, I guess they're podcasts, they're just on YouTube, and he has a great visual sense, so he can put visuals under his stories, and I've participated in some of them, and it's it's fun. I know one point I thought, oh, I'm going to be on Peter Bernard's channel, and someone will hear me, and uh, no, the, and, and now, uh, for example, uh, I figured uh, after all these years, I mean, I've always, oh, I'm going to go on Fiverr, and I'm going to read audio books. And now I've gone to do that. And to everybody and their brother is doing Fiverr pages. And everybody and their, the site, it's no longer you just make a little post and in 10 minutes you can sign up, offer your product, and you're on the way. It just, it just seems endless. And I need my own voiceover website and images and uh, I a written mission statement and uh, to cite these awards and uh, achievements I have made. And I, I haven't achieved anything yet. I've done a bunch of podcasts that thanks to Frank Edward Nora's diligence and none of mine uh, still proliferate and exist and are there for anybody to hear. And yeah, if and when I drop dead, there's some sort of legacy of Brett PQ River that's out there for for you uh, or for anybody if they're curious. But then again, uh, uh, I'm an old time radio fan, and I am seeing less and less people having an interest in that old stuff. I mean, even Gene Shepard, who is our hero here on the Overnight Scape Underground, um, nobody knows who he was. And even when you tell people, oh, he's the guy from that movie you watch every year and love, A Christmas Story, and he tells these great stories. And how many of those, when you tell them, say, oh, that's great, and go and find that and listen to and become and say, hey, that was great. No, it, it, we have moved on as a culture, and that's what cultures do, especially since the 20th century. 
the music star of uh, Al Jolson. Who knows who Al Jolson was anymore, except as some example of a horrible stereotype that shouldn't even be looked at anymore. Uh, he blacked up his face and did that minstrel show thing. And even the term minstrel show. No, the guy just, he was demeaning people by doing what he did by today's standards. And I don't know. Uh, it's just like I want to do on uh, the Big Appreciation Showcase. Bring some of this out, uh, some Jack Benny shows. Because Rochester, his uh, valet, who was a black man, Eddie Anderson, and beloved. I mean, he the people allowed who were very prejudiced li still listen to the Jack Benny program. And yes... He was treated in what would be considered a dismissive way, but he was always part of the family nonetheless. I, it's just really tricky because I can understand why these things are now considered offensive, but that we're shunning it. But I, I, we would have anyways. I mean, I'm not this. Uh, there are no old time radio shows that still resonate, just like the shows like I Love Lucy or The Honeymooners or any of these programs that proliferated and were very popular when I was younger. Um, even Nick at Night is very careful anymore if Nick at Night still exists, which does it? Do they still, like, make a thing out of playing old sitcoms with those horrible, like we talked about uh, when we talked about Doc Slee's, these shows where, you know, you, that the whole show is about a horse that talks, a man who has a genie, or um, the things that I like, these crazy, like Green Acres, if you've ever seen it, with these crazy country people, uh, the, the people out in the rural world living this, like, off-the-grid, weird, quirky characters that, I guess by today's standards might be considered offensive oh, you're making fun of southern people which is why i'm reticent i mean even when jimbo would say oh do your country voice you know talk like a texan or something uh, i felt like that was just not what you do anymore just like you know the caricature voices of different ethnic groups uh, that used to be a staple of comedy, and now that's not the thing. Uh, so, anyways, the Sex Pistols uh, are... Did, I saw them somewhere in the news again, and I thought to myself, who's going to go out and listen to the Sex Pistols? And that's a good question. Uh, what do you think about the Sex Pistols anymore? Do you know them? Do you think they were important? Um, th I mean, they really kind of were the storm, the first wave of what became new wave music and that whole 80s thing, which turned into like dance and romantic music somehow. So uh, music is always changing. And even in what's going on today, I'm sure it is this whole, I, I, I guess, I don't even know what they listen to every time I put it on. It's just so vocalists and this very not instrument driven I mean there aren't guitar solos that I know of it's a smoother product like it was stamped out or something and with a machine just chunk 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 and that's fine I mean it definitely sounds slick and some of it but it, it doesn't bother me. It just doesn't grab me. And I, I appreciate that people are still listening to music. I've just become one of those people who isn't anymore. And I, I did, the radio used to be on all the time. I would always be listening to music and looking for new bands and that new sound. And Probably as modern as I get is a Japanese artist named Toa Tei. And he does this really... That he has a sound to him that really appeals to me. I, I, it's dance music. 
Uh, he came up with a band called D Light, came over from Japan and was their DJ, and then, for whatever reason, retreated back to Japan and stayed there, found a niche for his music, and he really, I mean, he works with the people, the, the Beatles, the modern Beatles of Japanese pop music, Yellow Magic Orchestra, uh, who are now dying off. We lost uh, Ryuchi Sakamoto. Uh, we lost Yukihiro Takahashi in the last couple of years. And Harry Hosono, I believe, still lives. And his music is also very unique. And when Hosono works with Toa Te, to me, that's a beautiful thing. And I'm probably talking alien talk to, to, to anybody in any time frame, whether it's contemporary or some future time that people are looking back. But uh, that's just what I do. I, I almost am a list annotator, I feel like sometimes. But it, there's a flow to being me. And uh, speaking of music and uh, the public domain, uh, but let's hear something from deep in the past, say around 1924. <laughs> called Indian Love Call, and I'm, we're going to go a little bit over our normal 30 minutes here, because this is an example of what time will do to a piece of popular culture. The song, Indian Love Call, which you may recognize if you've listened to the music of, say, I guess, uh, Slim Whitman was the last person to make a hit, When I'm Calling You... Uh, but the song came from 1924 and was in a musical, that a theatrical musical, um, and it was called The Call, and it's from a 1924 operetta-style Broadway musical. The music's by Rudolf Frimmel and Herbert Stothart. 
I mean, have you have you ever heard of these people? And the book and lyrics were by Otto Harbach and Oscar Hammerstein II. And the song was popular in 1924. I, music came out of the Broadway musical theater in the teens and 20s. Pretty much the popular songs originated in some play on Broadway. Broadway shows were just, that was the thing. That was the pinnacle of show business and music and popular arts of the time. And I mean, now that there's still a Broadway stage, but it's just so different. It's more like some strange retro. Let's take a property or a film people like, like, for example, Little Shop of Horrors and turn it into a musical. And they're turning everything into a musical. And it's not, I mean, it isn't even Jesus Christ Superstar anymore to any great degree. It's become a different form of theater. Uh, but then Rosemary was revived for the old folk in 1936, 12 years later, and was a film with uh, Anne Blythe and Howard Keel. And it wasn't huge, but that people went to see it, and it repopularized the song. Nelson Eddy and Jeanette McDonald were the stars, and that they were big musical stars in their day, near the top of Hollywood. And the song became big again. And then way back in 1952, uh, and again in 1955 in the UK, Slim Whitman became a star singing the Indian love song. And really, it's kind of funny because nowadays, I mean, just the name of the song is no longer politically correct. And uh, he, Slim Whitman actually did another song from the same show, the title song, Rosemary. Up to, of all the queens that ever met, I do. Up to, I don't even know. Oh, of all the queens I've ever met, I choose you. Yes, I choose you to love me, my Rosemary. And... Yeah, it's, it's just the Indian love call. Um, yeah, it, so, yeah, I made my point, I guess, and uh, how pop culture and music and what is known and what isn't known just shifts. And now that I am getting old, I'm seeing it myself, and maybe you are too, wherever you are. And wherever you are, thank you for listening. Uh, be in touch you know where to find me uh, to probably right where you heard this from and uh, set the controls for the heart of the fun <laughs>